Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lee Liberman Otis, Senior Vice President of the Federalist Society and Director of our Faculty Division. On behalf of the Federalist Society, and specifically the Society's Faculty Division and Practice Groups, which are co-sponsoring this event, I'm delighted to welcome all of you here today to our first exclusively virtual preview of the upcoming Supreme Court term. Whether you're watching over Zoom, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, or via our webpage, we're delighted to have you with us. We are recording this uh, as is C-SPAN, uh, so you may find yourself uh, uh, on C-SPAN at some point uh, in the future, we don't know when. Before we turn to our discussion of the cases and other momentous aspects of the upcoming term, I wanna say a few words about Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who died two weeks ago. I first, I first met Justice Ginsburg 37 years ago when I was a law clerk on the DC circuit and she was a judge there. Judges are randomly assigned to panels on the courts of appeals and my boss, then Judge Scalia, was always delighted when they were on a panel together. Justice Ginsburg was an extraordinary woman, an extraordinary justice, an extraordinary lawyer, and an extraordinary American. I would like to ask for a brief moment of silence in her honor. Let me now introduce our moderator and then turn this over to him to introduce the rest of our panel and get our discussion underway. Robert Barnes got his bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of Florida. He's been a Washington Post reporter and editor since 1987. He joined the paper to cover Maryland politics and he has served in various editorial positions, including Metropolitan Editor and National Political Editor. He's covered the Supreme Court since November 2006. We very much appreciate his taking on the job of moderating this panel, despite many other demands on his time, given the unusual amount of Supreme Court news, even for this time of year. In light of this, we trust our speakers will give him an easier time moderating this panel than his fellow journalist, Chris Wallace, Wallace experienced a couple days ago. Over to you, Bob. Well, thank you, Lee. Uh, on the contrary, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, we're going to follow the usual rules, which is interrupt each other, belittle each other. I'd like to see you, you know, show your disagreement with eye rolls and uh, face scrunches. Um, and uh, we're going to move fairly quickly. Uh, and if I feel like one of you is taking too much time, I will gently nudge you along by saying something like, will you shut up, man, mm -hmm. uh, or lady, uh, as, as it depends. Um, it's a big term. They're all big terms right at the Supreme Court, uh, perhaps at this point, not as big as the one we had last year with so many controversial topics. And uh, you know, over time, we didn't finish until mid-July. Uh, the docket so far this year is uh, not as crammed, but, you know, maybe they're leaving uh, a little time for some unexpected cases that might arise after November 3rd. Um, so to start with, uh, we're going to go through, each of the panelists has a case uh, that he or she is going to talk about and uh, then we're going to do another round after that. So first, let me just say that your panelists are, and this is going to be much shorter uh, introductions, Oren Kerr, who's a professor of law at the University of California, Berkeley, Edmund Whalen, president of the Ethics and Public Policy Center, Elizabeth Papez, partner at Gibson Dunn, Aaron Hawley, uh, independent women's law center, and Alan Morrison, uh, Associate Dean at the George Washington University Law School. I think that you have their full resume, so you should look at them. And she's probably sick of hearing it, but Aaron's is the most interesting one. I'll just tell you that. So um, first, uh, we are going to start with Aaron, and she is going to talk about uh, one of the most notable uh, cases on the term stock it so far and that is the Affordable Care Act case, uh, California v. Texas. 
Great, great. Thanks so much for that introduction uh, and for having us all. Um, and yes, I have the privilege of talking about uh, the Affordable Care Act again. Um, this is the third time, of course, that the entire statute uh, has been before the Supreme Court. And of course, various provisions uh, have been up and back uh, from the court uh, a number of times. So not the first time, uh, to put it mildly, that the Supreme Court will take a look at the Affordable Care Act. And the centerpiece of this challenge, uh, as in uh, other challenges uh, to uh, this legislation, is again the individual mandate. So when we look at the Affordable Care Act, one of the more controversial position, uh, controversial provisions, excuse me, was set forth in Section 5000A and 5000AB. And under those provisions, it required certain qualifying individuals to ensure that they had purchased qualifying insurance. Uh, and if they did not purchase qualifying insurance, then they had uh, the responsibility uh, to pay a penalty uh, that was enforced by the IRS. Of course, we fast forward a few years to 2012, um, and we get the Supreme Court's decision in NFIB versus Sebelius. Uh, in this litigation, as most of you will recall, the focus of the litigation was really on the Commerce Clause. Uh, and the challengers uh, to the litigation were making uh, the argument that Congress has the power to um, regulate uh, entities, uh, to regulate items once they are in commerce. Uh, but on the other hand, they cannot force someone uh, to, in Justice Scalia's words, buy broccoli uh, or to, to enter that stream of commerce uh, themselves, that, as I said, the Affordable Care Act did. In a sort of switch, uh, the Supreme Court held uh, that the penalty provision uh, was actually a tax at least for constitutional purposes, statutory purposes, AIA purposes, it was a penalty. Um, but for constitutional purposes, uh, the provision uh, could be construed as a tax. Uh, so the Supreme Court uh, upheld the provision under the broader power of Congress to lay and collect taxes. So now we fast forward to about 2017. Um, and in this Congress, uh, under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, signed by President Trump, Congress zeroed out that individual mandate penalty that has sort of been the basis for upholding uh, the legislation in NFIB. So then we get a challenge from Texas and 18 other states. Um, and in this challenge, uh, Texas is alleging that uh, the uh, Affordable Care Act's individual mandate is now unconstitutional uh, because the, the mandate's penalty uh, is zero. Um, and they argue that, that a zero tax can't be any sort of tax at all. Uh, the case went to Judge O'Connor um, in Texas uh, District Court. Uh, this ju Judge O'Connor uh, struck down the individual mandate agreeing uh, with Texas and the other states. Um, and he also struck down the entire statute. Um, Judge O'Connor looked at NFIB um, and other cases and determined that uh, the mandate was inseverable uh, from uh, the other provisions of the ACA. Uh, but he put that severability holding um, uh, on pause, basically. He stayed his mandate. Uh, the Court of Appeals uh, took up the case, the Fifth Circuit. They agreed with Judge O'Connor uh, that the individual mandate can no longer be sustained under the taxing power. But this is sort of key for uh, procedural steps going forward. They disagreed as to severability. Uh, so what the court did was they basically punted um, and they remanded back uh, to the district court, um, told them to go back through the 900 page ACA uh, to analyze it with a fine comb um, and to see again whether the provision might be severable uh, from uh, the ACA. So it's in this sort of unique posture uh, that California and other states supporting the legislation file a petition for cert. And the Supreme Court somewhat surprisingly grants the petition because again, um, that they could have let it go back on remand, uh, the lower court could have considered severability again, uh, and then the case could have come back up through the Fifth Circuit. And at that point, uh, the court could have granted cert. But, but no, uh, they granted cert. Uh, so the question before the court um, is whether uh, first the individual mandate is constitutional and second uh, there's the legal question uh, if it's not uh, then is the entireable is the entire ACA uh, destined to fall or is the provision severable uh, so real quickly on the arguments made by the parties uh, California and the House of Representatives first argue uh, that uh, the states and individuals challenging it don't have standing uh, the District and Court of Appeals disagreed with this finding that they were compelled to purchase insurance um, and the state suffered harm from reporting uh, and other sort of paperwork requirements from state employees. Uh, then there's the question of the constitutionality of the individual mandate. 
And this, I think, is super interesting, because um, if you look back, commentators from both sides of the aisle really sort of poo-pooed this claim um, from the outset. But if you look at the court's holding in NFIB, uh, Chief Justice Roberts is very clear that the essential feature of a tax is that it raised some government revenue. So if you just look at NFIB, you've got a fairly strong argument to be made here uh, that maybe uh, a tax at zero um, isn't a tax at all. Uh, to me, the most interesting part of the case will be the question of severability. Um, we get a few clues um, as to severability from last term. Um, in the Thela Law case, uh, the Supreme Court uh, narrowly uh, applied uh, the severability doctrine. Uh, they found uh, the uh, structure of uh, the CFPB to be unconstitutional, but upheld the statute. Um, and in doing so, uh, Chief Justice Roberts used some interesting language. Um, he said that the settled severability doctrine is to try to limit the solution to the problem, severing any problematic portions, um, unless there's strong evidence that Congress intended otherwise. Um, so I think the real question here, uh, at least in my opinion, um, is the question of severability. Uh, the states uh, challenging uh, the provision say that you need to look to the 2010 findings of Congress, which found that the individual mandate was inextricably linked uh, because it provided funding for the other provisions. Uh, on the other hand, the House of Representatives um, and the uh, California and other states supporting the ACA argue that, that actually what we should look at is the 2017 legislation. Um, and in that case, Congress clearly contemplated uh, the ACA without an enforceable mandate with a zero penalty. Um, so uh, interesting uh, there uh, uh, to compare the two, 2010 versus 2017 um, and what that means uh, to severability. And I think I'm out of time. Okay, thank you very much, Aaron. Um, and just a reminder to those listening in, uh, we're going to uh, have a Q&A uh, session towards the end of this. Uh, we'll be taking questions from you uh, to Aaron, to any of the panelists and about any of the cases or we dis discuss or those that we don't uh, discuss. So um, if you have questions about that, and I do, uh, we'll, um, we will tackle those, I promise. Um, next up is Alan Morrison. He is going to be uh, talking about Department of Justice v. House Committee on the Judiciary, or as we call it in the press room, the Mueller grand jury uh, case. So what could be more exciting than trying to get access to the grand jury materials uh, uh, special counsel uh, Mueller uh, presented there. Uh, there's a problem, of course, and that there's a general rule of secrecy under the federal rules of criminal procedure uh, for materials uh, going before the grand jury. Um, I think most people agree that at some point that grand jury secrecy uh, should be eliminated, that is after passage of time. And in a number of cases, some of which my old office was involved in, uh, grand jury materials involving Alger Hess, the Rosenbergs, and even Richard Nixon's appearance before the uh, Watergate grand jury, all those eventually became public under what was considered to be an implied exception to Rule 6E that after some period of time for historically valuable materials, they should all be able to be turned over. And uh, the Justice Department has disagreed with that for a long period of time, not so much as a matter of policy, but because they thought that Rule 6E did not admit of any kind of inherent exception to it. Then a couple of years ago, the DC Circuit, the first circuit court uh, in some time to face that question, uh, ruled in favor of the Justice Department, saying that there was no inherent right to access to grand jury materials, no matter how long uh, they had been uh, laying fallow. Uh, at, in the meantime, before the recent D.C. Circuit case, uh, the Attorney General of the United States and the uh, Obama administration had sent a letter to the R Rules Committee saying, you know, we think that the law ought to be changed and there ought to be an historic exception uh, for that and perhaps other exceptions as well. The Rules Committee rejected that because they thought that it was not necessary to change the rules because all the cases had gone in favor of historic exceptions. Uh, that exception obviously no longer applies and it's going to have to be fixed uh, by the Rules Committee. This case is much narrower, however. Uh, this case involves an exception to the grand jury exception under which a judicial proceeding, matters involved in a judicial proceeding can be released. Uh, typically that arises in a case in which the defendant wants to cross-examine a witness who's appeared before the grand jury and 
in those situations, obviously the defendant gets the right to the grand jury material to see whether it's inconsistent or not. This case involves the question as to whether an impeachment proceeding before the Congress constitutes a judicial proceeding and hence subject to that exception. Uh, the DC circuit ruled that it did constitute a judicial proceeding and that's the question before, before, before the court. Uh, two other uh, points I wanna make about this case is one is uh, it's not clear that this case is not gonna become moot. Um, the subpoena that was issued was issued uh, during the time uh, that the impeachment proceeding was going on. Um, and two things have to happen for the case not to be moot on January 20th. Uh, President Trump no longer has to be in office, or even if he's in office, the, the House has to decide whether it wants to renew the subpoena or not. Uh, these problems were obvious to the court when they agreed to take the case. Uh, so it's unclear whether they're anxious to take the case or, or not. But of course, they decided to take the case uh, many, many months ago. I think I have a little bit of time left. So let me just talk about uh, one other uh, case that's before the court. It's called Carney against Adams. And it deals with the Delaware statutes uh, that provide for two different ways of seeing that there is a balance on the several of the courts, the Delaware Supreme Court and a couple of others. Uh, and they have two rules. One is called the bare majority rule. It's not my name, it's what they call it on, on the opinions. And under that, if there are, for example, seven judges on a court, no more than four can be of the same political party. Uh, the second rule is that if there is a vacancy on the court, the uh, constitutional provision in Delaware says that they must appoint someone from the a political party that will not cause the bare majority to rule to be uh, violated. That has been interpreted to mean that only Democrats and Republicans can serve on the Supreme Court of, of, of Delaware. And it was that provision that the Third Circuit said was unconstitutional. When they decided that, because that provision was added to earlier provisions, they invoked the doctrine of severability that Aaron mentioned just a moment ago uh, and, and concluded that because they were all part of the same legislative package, that the provision for the bare majority would go by the way of the uh, uh, Democratic Republican provision. And so they struck that down on severability grounds. Uh, the severability law in that situation seems to me to be the law of severability of Delaware, since it is Delaware's statute that we're trying to analyze, um, not the statute that uh, the Congress had enacted. And in any event, the court has both of these issues before it. And it also has a question about what's the arguable justification. Um, I, I, I joined an amicus brief uh, that said that the, the notion of political appointees and policy making had nothing to do with this, that the, the there was a legitimate interest in seeing that there was balance. I don't think the court is going to reach that issue, but if it does, it may say something about balanced representation, not only on courts, but in administrative agencies running from the Federal Election Commission uh, to the Federal Trade Commission to the Securities and Exchange Commission. So uh, we'll, keep, we'll keep an eye on, on that case as well. Thanks, Alan. Uh, yeah, it's some, somewhat appropriate that the court uh, kicks off its term with a question about political appointments to the Supreme Court, uh, isn't it? Um, uh, next up, Oren Kerr, uh, and he will be talking to us about a case called Van Buren uh, v. U.S. Thank you, Bob, and thank you to the Federal Society for inviting me here. Uh, the, talk, the case I'm talking about, uh, as mentioned, is Van Buren versus the United States, which is a criminal case involving a law called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. It's the federal computer hacking statute that was enacted in the 1980s. Uh, and although we've all moved to computers as we are uh, in this uh, panel, um, the Supreme Court has never interpreted what this law means. Uh, and it matters to a lot of people because it basically is saying how easy is it to commit a computer crime and how many of us are computer criminals by virtue of this 1980s law enacted in a very different era. Um, and so let me tell you the facts of the case and then turn to the legal issues. Van Buren is a police officer uh, who has access to a government database uh, of, of information about people. And uh, he accepted a 
payment to look up someone that some private party was interested in knowing about. So he used the government database for non-official reasons. Even though he had been trained, you're only allowed to access the database for official reasons. Uh, it turned out that was all part of a government sting. The FBI had actually had the person who'd asked Van Buren to look up uh, this individual uh, for the payment. Uh, it was all uh, part of a government sting. And Van Buren is then charged with violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act uh, on the theory that he had been told he should only access the database for uh, official reasons, and he had actually accessed the database for non-official reasons, and therefore he had violated the law. Uh, the law says that it's a federal crime to access a computer without authorization or to exceed authorized access uh, to any protected computer. And under the statute, a protected computer is basically any computer. The definition of it is any computer that can be reached under the Commerce Clause, which you think about like Gonzalez versus Raich means kind of any computer, really whether connected to the internet or not, everything is covered or pretty close to everything is covered under this law. So the really big question becomes what is access without authorization and exceeding authorized access. And in this case, it is agreed by the parties that the issue is whether Van Buren exceeded authorized access because he had been given an account to access the database. And so he had initially accessed it with authorization, but did he exceed authorized access? Uh, well, there's a statutory definition, which of course you turn to first, and here's what the definition is. The term exceeds authorized access means to access a computer with authorization and to use such access to obtain or alter information in the computer that the accessor is not entitled so to obtain or alter. Um, which, at least when I hear that, it's an entirely circular definition. It sort of just says you can't do what you can't do without actually answering what's the fundamental question of what you can't do. Why does this case matter? Well, the two sides have starkly different understandings of what the law means. The defense side, Van Buren side, says the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is just about computer hacking. It's about breaking in. Uh, and you're not breaking into a computer if you just uh, violate some sort of a written restriction or you were told not to do something and you did it anyway. That could be a contractual violation. Uh, it could be an employment problem, but it's not a federal crime. You're not, you're not hacking in. And so from the defense side, the defense argues this law should be construed to only apply to hacking, to breaking in, to circumventing some sort of a access restriction. The government's argument on the other side is that the law is intended to apply not only to somebody who hacks in, but also somebody who, upon gaining access, uh, has violated some restriction, including some written restriction, and therefore that Van Buren violated this law because he was told not to access the computer for uh, personal reasons, and he did so. Why does this case matter? Well, it matters because uh, the law is written so broadly. This statute, Section 1030A2 in Title 18, is so broad that it applies to basically any computer and basically any written restriction if it applies to written restrictions at all. So the Supreme Court has to decide, is this Computer Fraud and Abuse Act just about hacking or does it apply to hacking and violating any written restriction on a computer. That matters to a lot of people because if you've ever noticed, you're probably violating terms of service to a computer right now. Uh, uh, and so it's very common for people to violate terms of service to a website, to uh, an online social media site. You know, you have to tell the truth when you log into Facebook and give your real name. You're on a dating service, you have to give your real age. Um, and uh, the government's theory lays out the possibility that if the government is right, actually all of those acts are federal crimes uh, and that the statute is basically criminalizing kind of everyone and everything, or at least that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but not much. So this is really going to be coming to the Supreme Court to figure out what does this law mean and also answer how many people as they use computers are violating this criminal statute and potentially could be arrested and prosecuted. Uh, and. Uh, uh, the court has an opportunity to either adopt a narrow interpretation of the statute, just about hacking, or a broad interpretation. Uh, and I suspect either way it goes, it's ultimately going to come back to Congress to kind of come up with answers depending on what the Supreme Court's interpretation is. Thanks. Warren, do you, let me play editor for a second. Do you um, know if this is the only thing he was charged with, this officer? Uh, he was not. Uh, he was charged with other uh, another offense. He was also in charge with uh, wire fraud, if I recall correctly, or another uh, fraud offense. Um, uh, basically, I think it was like an honest services fraud idea. He was being bribed. 
Right. He was being bribed, exactly. So there's the bribe and then there's the computer hacking offense. And so that remaining bribery related charge is still there on remand after the court uh, decides this either way. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Uh, Elizabeth is going to talk about uh, a case involving Ford Motor Company and also a little bit about uh, uh, the business docket. Thanks, Bob and Lee and the society. It's great to be here and with all of you, albeit in the you know Brady Bunch format. I will. Um, <laughs> I'll get to the to the four cases. I mean, I, I you know I appreciate the moment on uh, Justice Ginsburg. She was a lion in so many ways, and actually one of the reasons I wanted to talk about the Ford Motor cases is it's an area in the court in which she's left quite a legacy. Uh, across uh, lines on the court, some supermajority opinions. I think it'll be a great segue to discuss what's on everyone's mind these days, which is her legacy as against the uh, current vacancy. And I think we can have some fun talking about that on the business docket, which has some great cases and also uh, a little bit of a constitutional flavor that uh, Aaron previewed in the Affordable Care Act case. The business docket, we're only about a third of the way into the grants and the term. We don't have the orders from the long conference, but already we We've got some big ticket cases. We've got the cases in the in the Ford matter I'll address in a moment about where companies can be sued in federal court. We've got cases about where a company, a domestic U.S. company, can be held liable for human rights abuses abroad, what constitutes fair use of a rival's intellectual property, when you can enforce your arbitration clause, and then, you know, when, when and, and whether companies can be uh, subjected to, frankly, massive liability uh, under the FTC Act, uh, also under the robocall statute, and then we've got this uh, Fannie and Freddie case I'll touch on at the last. Uh, that's where we're going to see what the court is going to do with these runaway agencies uh, that are unconstitutionally structured and out there regulating people. It goes to the severance point. Uh, on the Ford cases, I'll just spend a moment because they're so important. You see this in the amicus lineup. It's not just the auto industry, it's pharma, it's banking, it's you know consumers and, and, and big tech. The issue is where can a company that makes a product or delivers a service be sued by a person who's hurt as a result of using that product? The Ford cases, it's a simple fact pattern. There are two companion cases, uh, individuals who are driving Ford cars. Uh, one was injured regrettably. It was a fatal accident when a tire blew out. And the other was an instance where an airbag didn't deploy. So the, the bottom line is, in one case, the estate, in the other case, the injured plaintiff uh, sued Ford Motor for defective parts, the, you know, the tires and the, and the airbags. The issue in both cases is whether these plaintiffs were entitled to sue the company in the state in which they were injured. And the reason we care about this especially here at the society, but also as citizens, is our Constitution says that federal courts are courts of limited jurisdiction, and they can't exercise their power over a person or a defendant without due process. And the Supreme Court has long held that for a lawsuit to satisfy due process, one of two things has to be true. The defendant has to be at home in the state or the forum in which they're being sued. Because if you live there, you've consented to being sued there on anything that arises in the jurisdiction. These cases involve the second branch of jurisdiction doctrine, which is called specific jurisdiction. In that instance, the Supreme Court has said it's okay for a plaintiff to sue a defendant in federal court in a diversity case like this, if, but only if, the defendant's outreach or contacts with that forum relate directly to the suit or the injury and issue. This is a really important point, and what happened in both of these cases that are before the court now is state Supreme Court said, although it's uncontested that in both plaintiff's cases they didn't buy their car from Ford directly where they were injured, the cars ended up there as a result of a bunch of private resales. The cars were manufactured in a different state. You know, they were sold initially at retail in a different state. The mere fact that Ford does a lot of business in each of the states in Montana and Minnesota is enough to subject the company to suit, even though it had no 
direct causal relationship with the, these plaintiffs driving these cars or the injuries that occurred. That actually goes against a long line of, again, supermajority Supreme Court cases on the general jurisdiction side. Justice Ginsburg authored an opinion in 2014 in the Daimler case that said, general jurisdiction, namely exercising jurisdiction just because somebody's present there and you don't connect the suit to the defendant's conduct is permissible only in the defendant's principal place of business or headquarters or home state. Narrow the doctrine. On the specific jurisdiction side, the court has also long held in a series of 9-0 and 8-1 decisions that you've got to have a tight nexus between what the defendant did, its outreach to that forum, and what happened to the particular plaintiff. That does not appear to exist in either of these cases, which may explain the grant. Uh, I don't think this is one of those cases where, you know, whether Ju Judge Barrett is confirmed or not, uh, you know, that confirmation would affect the vote. Again, there's a long line of precedent, uh, 9-0s and, and 8-1s, to say that this kind of uh, nexus is not enough. And the reason is simple. If it were, then anybody who puts anything into the stream of commerce in any state can be sued there, and we might as well do away with the limits on general jurisdiction. So I think we'll see that in sharp contrast, I think, to that case and how the court has lined up on those issues kind of across, across lines. Um, there's some other business cases, and we'll touch on maybe the Fannie and Freddie case, which is very interesting, where I think you know, uh, the confirmation and the vacancy may actually implicate the court's lineup. Great, thank you. Uh, I've never moderated a panel in which lawyers have so abided by their time limits. I'm a little uh, shocked by this. We may be wrapping it up in no time at all. Um, Ed is gonna uh, take our next case, which uh, in many ways is a follow-up to uh, the issues that the court didn't get to uh, in Masterpiece Cake Shop. Uh, and it is sort of the intersection of uh, laws against discrimination and when they bump up against religious liberty. Uh, so Ed will be talking about a case called Fulton v. City of Philadelphia. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, the case of Fulton versus City of Philadelphia will be argued on November 4th, the day after election day. Uh, the issue in the case is whether a Catholic group can be barred from providing foster care services in Philadelphia because it abides by Catholic beliefs on marriage and approving families eligible to receive foster kids. As Bob indicated, the case is another uh, in the uh, series presenting the clash between religious liberty and LGBT non-discrimination norms. It uh, presents at one level how employment uh, division versus Smith might apply to the particular fact pattern involved uh, in the case. It also, uh, uh, more importantly, uh, tees up uh, Employment Division versus Smith for possible overruling. One, that's one of the questions on which the court expressly granted review. Uh, now, as I think many of you know, Employment Division versus Smith is the 1990 opinion of the Supreme Court in which uh, a five justice majority part of a six justice majority on the holding, but a five justice majority on the rationale, ruled that uh, neutral and generally applicable laws um, uh, that, that burden religious liberty, none, nonetheless uh, do, uh, present no free exercise claim. That uh, ruling is probably the most controversial ruling uh, by Justice Scalia among conservatives at least. Uh, it uh, was seen as overruling a line of cases that applied strict scrutiny to substantial burdens on religious liberty. Congress responded uh, very rapidly in 1993 with the Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which uh, reimposed the strict scrutiny standard that preceded Smith. Then, uh, four years later, in the city of, of Bernie uh, v. Flores case, the Supreme Court said that the federal RIFRA could not constitutionally be applied against the states. So uh, the RIFRA continues to apply against federal actors, but under uh, Bernie versus Flores, it does not apply against state actors. And that's why you had a flurry of, uh, of so-called uh, so mini RIFRAs, state religious freedom restoration acts uh, adopted in the states. And, and what we've seen in recent years is that the uh, unanimous consensus uh, in favor of uh, the federal RIFRA in 1993 has now come apart as the ideological valence of religious liberty um, has shifted uh, in the eyes 
uh, of many. Um, very briefly, uh, the, uh, in this case, the Catholic entity, Catholic Social Services, known as CSS, uh, makes a slew of arguments under Smith, saying that the city's actions reflect hostility to its religious beliefs, that the city has a system of individualized exemptions that takes the case out of Smith, that the city itself doesn't abide by the, uh, the non-discrimination non norms that it's trying to hold uh, CSS to. Uh, and uh, in turn, in the Supreme Court, the city has advanced a, a, a new argument that CSS is merely, quote, performing government services and exercising delegated government power, end quote, and has minimal free exercise rights in doing so. Now, I think that, that strikes me as a sweeping assertion of statism. We'll see how the court addresses it. Uh, the Catholic Church has been doing foster care work in Philadelphia from long before the city got involved. If the city can successfully contend that, that it's now simply performing government services, uh, that raises the question of what limits, if any, are there to a government entity's ability to make similar claims in other areas, whether it's marriage licensing, educating kids, or so on. Uh, so uh, there are various grounds on which the case um, could be decided one way or the other without revisiting Smith. It's also conceivable that the court uh, will uh, see this case as the occasion to, to revisit Smith. There are several justices uh, who have already expressed their hostility to Smith. Uh, we've also seen in recent cases an ability to uh, carve matters out of the scope of Smith, uh, whether implicitly or explicitly. So I'll tr try to stay within Bob's time limits and leave it right there. All right, thank you, Ed. Uh, could, could I ask Ed a small fact question? You may. Ed, I had heard someplace that the Catholic uh, Party, in this case, has never had a request from same-sex uh, couples to adopt a, a child. Uh, is that factually correct, and might that matter in terms of their standing in this case? Uh, I understand that to be factually correct. I don't think it affects standing in any way. Um, there, there are dozens of child placing agencies uh, from which prospective foster parents can request a home study. That's a prerequisite to getting approved, and including uh, you know, three that have received the human rights campaign's seal of approval. So uh, uh, yes, but the, the CSS says that no same-sex couple has ever asked it for home study, and if it did, the CSS would refer the couple to another agency, one that would be open to um, to uh, approving it for the home study. But no, I don't see how that, um, that, that bears on uh, standing. Of course, it could be a reason for the court to duck the case if it wanted to. It doesn't take any rule of law to duck a case that's dismissed as improvidently granted. Well, except of course, what's happened here is the um, agency has been uh, disqualified by the city from further participation. Uh, so that would not, I mean, that'd be a, a you know, ratifying the defeat for uh, the agencies. I don't see that as, as, as an option. The question is about their contract uh, with the city, right? Uh, yeah, actually, um, there was, there's a whole dispute back and forth over what course of action exactly is relevant. The city changed its contracts at one point to add um, specific broader language that it thinks strengthens its position. Uh, there's a question of whether there's a course of action before that that reflects religious hostility. Uh, I, I can't do justice to the back and forth between the parties on some of these uh, 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 factual assertions. So we've talked about some very uh, specific cases. I'd like now to ask uh, you to um, think about what Justice Ginsburg's death means what uh, Judge Barrett's confirmation might mean, and give me uh, the sort of bigger view of what you see this court term uh, being like uh, under these circumstances. And uh, Alan, let's start with you. I think the answer is uncertain. Uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming that unless something turns up uh, and people and or people change their mind, that, that, that Judge Barrett will become Justice Barrett at some point, and how many cases she'll sit on is, is, is hard to know, uh, depending on what happens. Uh, 
I just would want to say, uh, with regard to what Elizabeth said about the, the uh, Ford cases, uh, th those cases are quite different from all the cases that have come before uh, before the court. And and while uh, I've written that Justice Ginsburg was surely right in, in, in the outcome of the prior cases when it was the plaintiffs that were engaging in very aggressive forum shopping, uh, I, I disagreed uh, strongly with her rationales and the breadth of her opinions. Uh, this is a case about forum shopping, the Ford case, in which uh, uh, it's not at all clear, given Justice Ginsburg's vote in the McIntyre case, that she would have gone along with this. The Ford Motor Company is saying, yes, we sell thousands of cars. We have service centers and all sorts of things like that in every state in the country. But you, the plaintiff, happen to not be the original buyer of that car in this state, and therefore you have to sue us either in Michigan, Delaware, or where the car was manufactured or designed, if you can figure that out. That seems to me like forum shopping. And I think the message from these other cases is broad forum shopping is out. And uh, we'll see whether it applies the same to the plaintiffs and to the defendants. Uh, but overall, um, I, I would agree with Bob, what Bob said at the beginning, that the uh, court's docket is not really uh, uh, filled out first or as rich as it's been in prior years. On the other hand, all the cases that really came to the top at the end of the term were cases that were granted uh, well after uh, September or October. So uh, it's very hard to know now. Um, obviously, uh, Justice Barrett will not vote the same way as Justice Ginsburg did on, on many cases. Uh, but my view has always been that you don't really know what a judge is going to be like when she or he gets to the Supreme Court until they've been there a while. Uh, Justice Scalia was, in, in my view, much more moderate when he was on the Court of Appeals, uh, not because he was hiding anything, but because the docket was different and his position in the judiciary was different. So it's hard to tell. Uh, Judge Barrett is, is a extremely able uh, lawyer, and uh, so you just never know when you get uh, cases and you're in the Supreme Court, you see things quite a bit differently. And so while I'm not uh, hoping that she's going to be a substitute for Justice Ginsburg, I, I'm not willing to write her off either. Um, Aaron, one of the uh, things that has uh, sort of been immediately mentioned is that one of the five members who upheld the Affordable Care Act uh, in is obviously gone uh, now. Justice uh, Judge Barrett has been critical of the ACA. But, uh, you know, I go to a, a listen in on a number of these Supreme Court reviews, and I'm struck by how many people, uh, lawyers who aren't fans of the ACA, who don't think that this case at the Supreme Court is a five to four one, as you said, that it might uh, have much more to do with the question of severability uh, as to whether the ACA um, survives. Uh, could you talk about that? Sure, sure, absolutely. And first I wanted to mention just a um, sort of wrinkle on timing. Um, as Alan mentioned, we don't know when um, Assuming Justice Ginsburg, or excuse me, assuming Judge Barrett is confirmed to replace Justice Ginsburg, we don't know when that will occur. Um, if it does take place uh, before November 10th, uh, which is when the court uh, will hear Texas versus California, then of course she'll sit for that case. Um, the tradition is uh, that if a judge is not confirmed uh, when oral argument is heard, uh, then they don't participate. So Judge Kavanaugh, for example, recused himself from cases in which oral argument had already been heard. Same for Justice Kagan. Uh, so pretty safe assumption that Justice Barrett will vote on the cases uh, only after uh, her confirmation, assuming that happens. So if the case is 4-4, um, I, I think that's unlikely for reasons I'll mention. Uh, but if it is 4-4, the only thing that happens um, is that the Fifth Circuit's opinion on the individual mandate is upheld. Uh, because they remanded on the severability issue, uh, that remand will still take effect. So it'll go back to the Fifth Circuit, and then it'll go back to the district court to consider severability. Uh, so there, there won't be any decision if it's 4-4 uh, in regard to the entire statute, mm -hmm. um, which I think is interesting. Um, and then also, as you mentioned, I think that there's becoming a, a greater consensus as this case winds its way uh, through the courts uh, that the constitutional question may not actually be that close. Um, you do have a, a Congress in 2017 that zeroed out the tax penalty. Uh, the Supreme Court in NFIB, at least in my opinion, sort of stretched things in order to call it a tax. Uh, but they were very clear, the chief was very clear that in order to be a tax, the essential feature was that it must raise some revenue. 
Um, and if we're talking about a broad power, uh, that would certainly be the taxing power with no requirement uh, that there be any sort of revenue raising. Um, the government does all sorts of things uh, through the taxing power, uh, but the sort of check on that uh, is that the government is accountable and that the public generally doesn't like taxes. Um, and so the people will call the elected representatives to it'll count, uh, but if taxes loses the meaning of being a tax, uh, then that check on the power um, is absent. So um, I can see the Chief Justice uh, finding that problematic uh, under uh, uh, the new 2017 statute, um, but I, I think you're exactly correct. The question really does boil down to severability. Um, the Fifth Circuit punted on this, um, but if you look at what Congress did in 2017, I think there's a really good argument to be made uh, under the Supreme Court's old and, prior, uh, and present cases uh, that the doctor, that the rest of the mandate is severable. Um, and the reason for this is if you look at the 2017 Congress, they obviously thought an unenforceable mandate was compatible with the rest of the ACA. Uh, we're not talking about the situation in 2010 where they were counting on the revenue uh, from that uh, mandate to sort of prop up pre-existing coverage and that sort of thing. They, they tossed all that out the window uh, with 2017. So you've got a Congress that clearly thinks uh, an unenforceable mandate is compatible with the ACA. Um, and I can see a court, especially one that, that may be reluctant or or certain members may be reluctant uh, to, to step into a huge political fight um, to, to find severability in a incumbent is not reelected and the Senate goes to the Democrats, uh, Congress could pass a statute amending the ACA to provide a tax of $100 a year or some number like that, which would clearly raise some revenue. And that would at least moot the controversy and get the Supreme Court out of a tough situation. Uh, I, it certainly would be a sensible way to, for, the, for the Democrats to do that, assuming they have the power uh, to do that. Uh, Aaron, do you think that would work in terms of, of mooting the controversy or at least giving the court a reason to send it back uh, to the lower courts? It certainly would give them reason to send it back um, because you'd have a different constitutional analysis. And the, the shared responsibility payments in the first statute were not necessarily large. Uh, so the court could find $100 to be sufficient. Um, but I think as a constitutional matter, they would at least have to find that, the, yes, Congress is imposing a tax. They're, they're charging at least $100 if you violate it uh, rather than, than an unenforceable mandate. Well, just so long as we can find some way to keep ACA litigation going, you know, that's what everyone wants, I think. Um, Oren, what do you think about the, what, what do you foresee about the term uh, in these unusual circumstances that the court is facing? Well, I wanted to go back to the question, even the broader one, Bob, that you were suggesting about, you know, wh where does the Supreme Court go with assuming uh, Amy Coney Barrett is confirmed and becomes Justice Barrett? And, and I, I would guess that on the whole, we're going to see a considerable and perhaps quite rapid shift to the right. Uh, and, and, and I think it's sort of almost hard to remember that you know the, the Supreme Court can in fact change direction, and we we almost lose sight of the fact that that's common in Supreme Court history, and we don't see that because we've had a history that's kind of remarkable of the last you know say forty years or fifty years where we had Justice Powell, the kind of moderate Republican, as the center swing vote, and then it became Justice O'Connor as the kind of moderate center swing vote, and then Justice Kennedy as the sort of moderate center swing vote, and then we had Chief Justice Roberts as the swing vote, and you know, uh, would have been sensible to say, well, then things will shift. Although I think in light of Trump being president, I think Chief Justice Roberts, um, to try to ensure some sort of stability at the Supreme Court, to have the court be kind of the one institution in American life, which is not doing you know wacky things. I think he basically sort of remade himself as the moderate centrist uh, uh, Republican uh, uh, appointee swing vote. And the court didn't change very much. Uh, if you have... Uh, Justice Barrett on the court, suddenly Chief Justice Roberts, who I think is sort of fundamentally a conservative and was being, you know, more institutional maybe than it would be his natural uh, state, he's not even a swing vote anymore. Uh, he has the assignment power, but the swing vote on the court becomes, I guess, Brett Kavanaugh maybe or Neil Gorsuch maybe, depending on the case. And a Supreme Court with uh, Brett Kavanaugh or Neil Gorsuch as the swing vote, as sort of the fifth vote needed to make majority. That's a very conservative court. Uh, and so I think I think we're looking at 
some considerable shifts. Um, it, it, maybe it'll take a turn. Maybe they'll slow down at first because they've got the cert grants from prior uh, prior terms. But I, I, you know, I think the history, at least to me, suggests that when you have a majority that has a very clear uh, kind of ideological direction, the court generally goes in that direction. This is, I think, the, the lesson of the Warren court after Felix Frankfurter steps down. The court just didn't kind of sit around and and have you know just sort of sit on you know, just wait, uh, they moved. Uh, and so I, 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 I would at least guess that we're going to see some significant movements in a way that we haven't seen before, uh, at least in a long time. Ed, are you rubbing your hands in anticipation? Well, I agree with uh, much of what Orrin just said. That is, I think that the, the chief, um, having been lauded for occupying the, the median position on the court uh, this last term will uh, no longer be there. Uh, of course, as Oren pointed out, he may have been he may have been to the left in that median position because of a response to uh, President Trump. So it might well be that um, even apart from a, a new justice, he would have swung back right uh, if that is um, uh, Joe Biden is elected. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I think the, the chief will have the challenge of either um, you know building some middle coalition with either. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh or Justice Gorsuch, um, or uh, being on the losing end of, of, of some cases or making it a six justice majority. The one point I'd emphasize though, um, that I think uh, counsels against a uh, notion of um, sort of rapid shifts across the board is that contrary to reports um, of her position on stare decisis, uh, Judge Barrett uh, very much adheres to a traditional view of stare decisis and has emphasized that it's perfectly fine for the Supreme Court to um, accept as an operating presumption that um, uh, precedents have been rightly decided uh, until such time as it's necessary to, to revisit them. So, and she's, she's, uh, you know, she's emphasized that the court doesn't have to go seeking out cases to overrule. So I, I, I don't think, um, you know, I, yes, the court will be very different if she replaces Justice Ginsburg. I don't think you're going to see a, uh, an immediate uh, uh, search and destroy mission on uh, a lot of precedents. Well, I mean, this is a court that uh, doesn't seem that reluctant to overturn precedent, except for uh, Justice Kagan, who talks about it a lot. Uh, Elizabeth, what do you see uh, when you think about the term that's coming up? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think I, I, I view it in two pieces, right? I think. Certainly in the business docket, which is where I, you know, practice most. Uh, as I said at the outset, I don't think there's going to be any, you know, major shift. I think in part because a lot of those cases are decided uh, on the terms of very specific statutes and in line with uh, the court's own precedents in ways where there are already the votes, you know, for a particular result. So I don't think there's going to be a lot of play in the joints there. You know, to Alan's point on the, even on the jurisdictional cases. I mean, I agree that new composition might uh, affect the breadth or the rationale of some of the rulings, like in the Ford cases, you know, we could spend an hour on them. There are some differences, but I think at bottom, you know, if these state Supreme Courts are correct, you know, they've elided the distinction between general and specific jurisdiction in a way that's very difficult to reconcile, you know, with Justice Ginsburg's Daimler opinion, and that's a fact. Where I think, you know, you'll see, you know, to get to a finer point, and you see this in the briefing, interestingly, uh, is that Ford and, and its uh, Miki are urging a proximate cause standard where you have to have a really tight nexus between, you know, the defendant's contact with the state and the suit. Solicitor General's office, interestingly, has not taken that position, and they were not granted separate argument time to for their more moderate view on that. Back in the Bristol Myers case three years ago, the Solicitor General's office, as I recall, did urge approximate cause standards. So that's where you know it's at that level of granularity, and in writing these opinions, that I could see some differences. Uh, I will tell you, I think the area where we could see differences, and it goes to you know, the severability point that Aaron mentioned, we're gonna see it this term in the Fannie Freddie case. We saw it last term in the in the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau case, say La Law, is what to do about, a, a, you know, an, an unconstitutional agency that's taken action against someone. And then, you know, one option as well, if they were unconstitutional because the statute that made them had some 
problematic provision, right? And this this term in, in the Fannie Freddie case, it's the same as last term with the CFPB. There's a provision that says the person at the agency making the decisions and enforcing federal law is not adequately supervised by the president, so they're not politically accountable. It's a constitutional problem. We're supposed to have people exercising law who are accountable to our elected officials. That's bedrock. The issue is what to do about it. If you take out that provision and you leave the agency to operate, that may be fine on a prospective basis. I think the hard question arises and where the composition of the court could really matter is what to do about the violation that occurred when the constitutional defect was present. You may recall you know, the court confronted some National Labor Relations Board decisions uh, in the Noel Canning case, the SEC administrative law judges. You know, the court was trending in a direction of constitutional violations need to mean something. And if they were, uh, if a constitutional violation resulted in a decision that actually hurt or affected someone, there may be a serious problem with just saying, well, let's take out the bad provision of the statute, rubber stamp the unconstitutional decision and roll along. That's frankly, you know, the court was on the bubble on that. There was a lot of vote splitting in the state of law opinion last term. This is where I think, you know, uh, the composition of the court could matter, that Judge Barrett may, you know, be stronger uh, on some of these remedial issues, frankly, than we saw in the sale of split last term. Yeah, no, I would wonder, Elizabeth, too, if she might consider that this it's a structural violation, right? So whether that might matter, do you, do you think um, a constitutional structural violation might make a difference? I think so, just from the standpoint that, you know, doctrinally, if it's a structural problem, the act that the government agency took, you know, is, is void ab initio, right? It was never authorized. And you've got some precedent for this in the appointments clause, you know, not to get too nerdy on this, but, you know, the, the, the current cases are about removal. We have cases that are just on the on the front end, right? If some officer of the United States was not constitutionally appointed, then everything that person did was was void. Some people, I think, try to draw the distinction. I don't know that she would between saying, "Well, once you're appointed, if you're not politically, you know, accountable, everything you do is still void." Because once you're appointed and you're in office, the only thing that renders you accountable to the people and disciplines you is the threat of removal by an elected official. So I do think the structural nature of some of these violations will matter. And I think, what, you know, where the rubber is going to meet the road and it's going to have a big practical consequence. You see this all over the country right now. There are tons of cases that are grappling with the issue the court, you know, left for remand in Sela Law on June 26, which is you can sever this bad provision that made the CFPB unconstitutional until the court took the provision away. What happens to those decisions, enforcement decisions going forward? Can they can the agency just stamp them and keep rolling? Or do they have to start over from square one and make sure that they have the jurisdictional and limitations and all the other boxes checked to keep going? So that it's going to be, I think, a, a big deal and it could really be consequential with the new composition of the court. There's a case on the on the uh, pending docket, which could be announced any time. It's actually several cases coming from the federal circuit involving the appointment of administrative patent judges. Yeah. Uh, and there's a question of whether they're inferior officers or principal officers. While, and, and this issue about retroactivity, if you, if you call it that, uh, some of the of the parties uh, didn't object at the administrative level. Some of them objected at, 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 the, at the court level. Uh, but unlike the CFPB, where there's only one administrator who's doing something, there are, I think, 360 patent judges whose decisions regularly get uh, appealed to the federal circuit. And uh, quite apart from the quite difficult and interesting question on the merits of whether they're inferior officers or not, uh, this remedial issue uh, is going to be huge in terms of practicalities. Um, and uh, I think uh, Elizabeth's firm is, has, has got at least one of those cases. And uh, uh, those of us who are interested in the administrative law side are, are, are puzzling about what to do about it. Uh, I don't think we care about who's, as between two patentees, who's, who's, who's winning and who's not. Uh, but we are concerned about how, in, how this is going to impact not just the, the patent judges, but the judges at all the rest of the administrative agencies, and perhaps other judges at places like Social Security or uh, the uh, immigration judges. So uh, it's a huge issue uh, that the court is going to have to face. And uh, whoever the replacement is uh, for, for Justice Ginsburg or whenever 
that comes about, that case will certainly be heard by a full full nine judges justices, and a good thing it will be to have them all of them on, on the on the court. But that's a really significant uh, case uh, across the business community. That is, people can be on both sides. Uh, indeed, I imagine there's probably some companies that are on both sides of the issue coming up from the, from the uh, federal circuit. Um, let me ask you, there was a, a case in, uh, from Wisconsin in the spring about uh, voting. It was called Republican National Committee versus Democratic National Committee. The court split five, uh, four on it. It seems like the kind of case that the court really hates to weigh in on, but not a day, uh, certainly not a week goes by. Lately, it's been not a day goes by that I don't see another emergency application get to the court about uh, some voting change. So uh, could you talk a little bit about how these voting issue, these cases about how people vote, how the ballots are gonna be counted, uh, affect the court leading up to the election and then just speculate on what's going to happen after the election since the president uh, seemed to indicate fairly strongly the other night that he expected uh, you know the court maybe will decide this who'd like to go first do i have to pick someone Lauren. I was hoping you wouldn't pick me because I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not well situated uh, uh, to answer these questions. Although after the mess that was Bush versus Gore, I just hope the Supreme Court stays as far away from these cases as possible. Can they? I mean, I think it largely depends on what lower courts do. Um, but but I think the it makes a big difference in terms of the justices' attitude uh, of you know should should the Supreme Court be the institution that answers these questions and at least the that what we know of what happened following the election of 2000 the justices at least there was a majority that were um, thought you know we we need to be the ones that resolve this and uh, that did not put the justices in their fi finest hour to to put it mildly so um hopefully other institutions can can take this and it won't come up to a supreme court especially in light of uh you know statements from from president trump that he wants to have uh judge barrett on the court to be the a key vote for him in the prospect that there's election litigation just it's 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 not going to be a happy situation if we get there and i i hope we don't ed what do you think and uh as has the president put uh judge barrett in a place where she'll be asked to recuse and should she well, folks are already asking. Um, I'm not sure that the president's actual remarks were exactly as Orrin uh, just depicted them, but I, I, I will take a look and uh, perhaps I'm mistaken. Um, look, uh, recusal is a um, decision that's made, uh, it's heavily fact dependent and made in a particular context. Have in mind back in 2016, Ruth Bader Ginsburg made lots of remarks, uh, very derogatory of uh, Donald Trump. Uh, no one was suggesting at that time that if there were um, election litigation, she would have to recuse. And in fact, her derogatory remarks uh, had a lot to do with his failure to disclose his taxes. Yet uh, she did not see fit um, to recuse um, from the two big cases that presented the very question um, whether um, entities could seek to obtain his uh, financial records uh, this last year. Um, I share Oren's desire that um, there not be issues like this. I think it's uh, quite possible that, that if there are, um, uh, you know, it may well be that there be a, you know, a supermajority um, uh, ruling uh, against some challenges in a way that, um, you know, could have some uh, long-term benefits for the court. My read, though, Bob, you follow this more closely than I have, so correct me if I'm wrong, uh, is that in, in the election-related challenges so far, the court has um, largely um, had the rule that the state, existing state rules stay in effect, that lower federal courts should not be changing those. Now, what happens uh, with some of the cases that involve state courts changing those? Um, it gets a little more complicated. Um, but I think the court is um, go going to um, abide by a, a principle that the, the rules that are uh, the state has uh, enacted legislatively are the rules that, that ought to govern. That doesn't mean there won't be disputes, but it at least provides a, a baseline for um, deciding those. 
Mm -hmm. Aaron, uh, this would be one that your old boss, I'm sure, would not be that happy to see uh, come to the court. His worry about uh, the uh, institutional reputation of the court. Uh, do, do you think the other justices share that? Is he uh, is he the one man band there? Um, that's a good question. I, I think probably no. I think um, he may be the most uh, cautious about wading into sort of political battles uh, of the current justices, and as you mentioned earlier, sees the court. Um, as an institutional, as an institution, and has an institutional prerogative um, at many times. Um, but I would think that the entire court uh, would be skeptical. There's, of course, the whole political question doctrine that comes up a lot in the election context and whether judges are capable of uh, rendering judicially manageable standards. Um, so, so from time immemorial, uh, judges have been cautious uh, about weighing into intensely political matters. So I think that that would be shared across the court, uh, but you're certainly correct that it would be a particular concern of Chief, Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts. Mm -hmm. I just want to tell those listening in, uh, we do want to take your questions. Uh, there, uh, There is the raise your hand uh, um, symbol that will uh, start taking questions on. Uh, some other questions will be coming in other ways. Um, and so please um, please give this panel uh, some questions. They'd like to take them. Um, Elizabeth, is there uh, another case? Is there anything else from that's coming up in the term that you think that we should talk about? Um, I guess, it, you know, there's lots of things. The question is, you know, from which perspective? I, I think there's some very interesting statutory interpretation cases coming up. Uh, one of them is, a, you know, I think particular consequence. These are the um, FTC cases, uh, AMG, and a companion case out of the Seventh Circuit. Literally just yesterday, the Seventh Circuit was out there on its own, uh, splitting with all the other circuits on the question the Supreme Court is going to take up until yesterday when it got a companion uh, in the Third Circuit. And, and the question is whether the Federal Trade Commission in enforcement actions can subject uh, regulated industries or companies to a broad range of equitable remedies that the agency has deemed to include literally billion dollar uh, monetary penalties or disgorgement on the rationale that if, for example, uh, a business engaged in some conduct that deceived a consumer, every penny that the business earned, you know, from that act or practice or product should be disgorged. Uh, you know, it's a tremendous hammer for the government in these cases. And what's up before the court is um, for a long time, and, and I think this is a kind of a trend uh, that would continue if Judge Barrett is confirmed that the justices have been much more careful about looking at the language of statutes. Last term in an SEC case, uh, a case called Lou, the Supreme Court upheld the SEC's authority to impose those kinds of remedies because the SEC statute said in black and white that the agency had the power to issue injunctions, which is conduct restraint, uh, as well as traditional forms of equitable relief, which, you know, if you go back in history, included money. Uh, the FTC statute has no such words. Actually, it says the agency can grant injunctions, period, not other orders, not other equitable relief. And so I think in that case, you know, and, and many others, I, you know, I, I could cite, we're going to see the court confronting uh, very consequential uh, cases that are going to turn on the language of a particular statute. And one of the things that, you know, sort of encouraged me when I was looking at some of Judge Barrett's, uh, uh, Judge Barrett's opinions from the Seventh Circuit is she's been excruciatingly attentive to statutory language. She had a, a case uh, where it was a, a trade secrets case, and she was in, she just done the same thing on jurisdiction, but in the trade secrets case, she focused very specifically on what the language was and then distinguished it from the language and the focus of trademark and patent cases. And so I thought, you know, this is exactly the kind of careful jurisprudence uh, and attention to statutory detail that is so important at the Supreme Court level. We have many cases coming up, and uh, I think that approach is exactly right because that's what the justices should be doing looking at the language of the law.
Alan, is there anything from your uh, perspective that uh, you either uh, are looking forward to the court doing or hoping the court won't do or? Uh... I think there's one issue on which the court is unanimous and that is that the election not be close. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, I think that that's the, right. I would say to the extent that one tries to read tea leaves into what the court has done in these various election cases in the last year or so, um, it's very hard to do because most of them have no opinions in them and not extensive uh, briefing. Um, but to the extent you can see anything, it, it looks as though they're in favor of, I think maybe Ed said this, uh, of stability. That is to not interrupt things in, in the middle. On the other hand, we have a, the, the coronavirus is, is different. Uh, it's not something that anyone could reasonably have anticipated before. And that at least where a state legislature uh, or perhaps a duly authorized uh, agent has has author authority to, to make changes, to take into account current circumstances. I think the court will be more likely to sustain those regardless of what the lower court say. And, and But when people are trying to get the court to make changes, I think this court is not gonna be willing to do that in the middle of the, of the election. May I say one other word about the question about the Judge Barrett's possible recusal, um, it, it, assuming that she is uh, on, on board. Uh, as some of you may remember, uh, in 1974, uh, when the Nixon case was, ta tapes case was before the Supreme Court, uh, William Rehnquist uh, recused himself in that case. Uh, there was no reason given for him uh, doing that. And I think that that may be a question about whether he did it because of his closeness to, to Richard Nixon or for some other reason, including the fact that he had been criticized uh, a couple of years before for not recusing himself in a case called Laird against Tatum. Uh, I don't think the president has done his nominee any, any favors uh, by saying that he wants her there in time to decide, help decide the election and is pushing for her confirmation uh, before, the, before the election. Uh, but she, as, as, as Ed pointed out, will have to decide for herself. I'm sure that the senators are going to ask some questions about it. And of course, she shouldn't be pinned down on how she's going to decide cases, but whether they will view whether you're going to sit on this case uh, differently uh, as, a, as a matter of, of what senatorial views on the outcome. Uh, I know that we have some participant questions. I am having trouble seeing them. So I'm just going to ask the tech support uh, folks to uh, help me out on that and to um, unmute uh, someone who has a question. I think Ben Sellers is first. While we're waiting, if I may, I just, just checked the transcript of the debate the other night. And Chris Wallace asked, are you counting on the Supreme Court, including a Justice Barrett, to settle any dispute? Trump said, yeah, I think I'm counting on them to look at the ballots, definitely, as though they're going to be examining the ballots one by one. In any event, I think, I think it was a general statement that, that he expects the court to um, handle disputes. I don't think it was anything, uh, that statement at least, anything that, that creates a special problem for uh, uh, Judge Barrett. I suppose that's up to who's listening and, and what else has come before it. Uh, we shouldn't construe it like a statute, however. We, we can... Uh, ben Sellers, are you there? I don't hear him. I think he's gone. Who's next? Paul Breivik, are you there? Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your day to put this on. Um, earlier this year, it uh, made the news that the court denied certiorari in a number of Second Amendment cases, and I know they haven't addressed that in some years, but uh, assuming Judge Barrett is confirmed, do you foresee any substantial change in the court's uh, attitude towards Second Amendment petitions. Thank you. Who'd like to take that? I, I'm happy to address that. I, I, I do think that uh, whether on the se Second Amendment or, or other issues, the fact that the court has um, been uh, inclined to deny review in a number of cases is something that, that will probably will change uh, if, uh, if we have a Justice Barrett. Uh, it's, it's much easier to get uh, 
four votes um, for a um, conservative review of an opinion below when you have, um, you know, at least uh, five justices um, to, uh, to, to choose from. So, uh, of course, Justice Barrett has written a uh, significant dissent on a Second Amendment issue that's gotten some attention. Uh, and I think she would be uh, very open to um, tr trying to provide the lower courts uh, greater guidance than they have on these Second Amendment issues. In fact, I think she listed that as her most significant uh, decision in the Senate questionnaire that she just filled out. Uh, it, it has been a surprise to those of us who cover the court that the court has not taken up uh, more of the Second Amendment uh, issues, especially this term after Justice Kavanaugh in agreeing uh, uh, that they shouldn't decide the New York case that was theirs called upon more. Uh, does anyone have a theory as to why they didn't take the, any of those cases? Well, I've heard the theory banded around is the Chief Justice was on the, the, uh, the conservatives, the supporters of the Second Amendment were concerned that the Chief Justice might not be on board and they didn't want to want to take the get, take these cases unless they had uh, a fifth vote. Uh, by the way, I, I am uh, a believer that the Second Amendment has been overused and is being overused. But I actually agree with Judge Barrett's dissent in, in the case in which he basically said uh, the, the person was charged with criminal f with fraud, convicted of fraud, and uh, was denied the right to have a gun. And uh, Judge Barrett said, I think correctly, uh, that the old cases about felons not having the right to have a gun dealt with people who are dangerous uh, and people who commit fraud may be dangerous for other reasons, but having nothing to do with the guns. I, I remember when the uh, Justice Scalia's decision in Heller, case in which I participated on behalf of the district, uh, made no exception in his opinion, said felons are, can be uh, denied guns. And I thought that that was probably wrong, that Scooter Libby and uh, uh, Martha Stewart uh, should not be denied guns because they were convicted of felonies. Uh, but uh, that's, I, I think, a relatively easy Second Amendment case. The much harder ones that are going to come up are the question about the uh, concealed carry and, and the right to carry out in public. And um, the court may, may take, well take those cases that, uh, that it's turned down before. We have a question from John Adler. Hello. Um, yeah, so I was curious what folks thought about uh, both uh, Prospective Justice Barrett's influence on standing doctrine and in particular whether any of the folks on the panel think that uh, the Chief Justice might like to use a case like California versus Texas to curtail Article Three standing generally and perhaps uh, curtail the doctrine of special solicitude for state standing. That's something that the Chief Justice clearly was not happy with in Massachusetts versus EPA. And it seems a case in which the basis for standing is a provision of federal law that has no enforcement mechanism might well be a, a good opportunity to do something like that. Who would like to take a standing question? Reporters do not take standing questions. Warren, I'm calling on you. <laughs> um, I would ask Jonathan Adler, who was just uh, <laughs> calling. Uh, you know, he'd be a great person to talk about this. I, I mean, I think that's certainly a possibility. Uh, um, I mean, I, I share that. I should also add, I share that sense that the idea of giving this sort of state standing is some of these cases is a, is a stretch um, uh, and, and could be cut back. So um, I think it's certainly certainly possible, although I don't know specifically Judge Barrett's views and how that would how that would fit in. Aaron, do you have some views on this? With regard at least to individual standing, I'm not sure that California versus Texas is the case to pair that back. Um, precisely because an unenforceable mandate seems problematic under the taxing clause. Um, Jonathan might disagree with that. Um, but when you have, uh, it seems like individuals should be given some uh, way to challenge a provision, um, presumably when we want people to follow federal law. Um, and if we just have all these federal laws that are presumably unenforceable, um, you still may have standing to challenge them. Well, uh, I, it, it's, I mean, I, 
the question of what the standing is of the state of Texas and how it's injured. Uh, I mean, this was the same issue that, that came up uh, with with uh, the, the DAPA case uh, several years ago, back, back in the Obama administration, where they had standing because they had to issue licenses to people who got DAPA benefits. Um, this last term in, in the SELA law case uh, that, that Elizabeth, I think, mentioned, uh, the, there was a standing issue there because uh, although the head of the CFPB was duly appointed uh, in accordance with the appointments clause, the president could not remove him. And uh, I and, and others, including Paul Clement, raised the issue as to whether they had stand the, the seal law had standing to object to the president's inability to fire uh, somebody. And uh, the court, Chief Justice Roberts' writing just blew it by, didn't seem to be any, any difficulty for him at all, and uh, gave it the back of his hand. And so it's hard to know. I mean, I, I've written something that says uh, you don't have standing unless we want you to have standing. And, and that's the problem, I, I think, with standing. I tell my students that uh, it's the worst doctrine. I don't, I've written about it, litigated on both sides, testified about it, and I wish it would go away, but it's not going away. Uh, and uh, people use it when, when they want. Justice Ginsburg, for example, uh, used the standing in a couple few years ago in, in the Virginia uh, Bethune K County case, I think it was called, uh, the standing to say that legislatures, the one house of Virginia couldn't challenge uh, a law changing to redistricting. So, you know, it's where you stand is where you sit on the standing doctrine. It's sort of like uh, the rules for a stay, right? It's uh, if there are five votes uh, for it. Um, Elizabeth? Well, I was going to say, Alan took the words out of my mouth. I mean, in the sort of, I guess it's Sela Law 2.0 in the Fannie Freddie case this year, yes. you know, in the yeah. Fifth Circuit opinion, there's a big standing issue. And, you know, one of the ways that they, I think the litigants, and I can't remember exactly the briefing on this, but they tried to posture it is don't worry, because in this particular case, uh, you know, the issue is that the FHFA is the, the conservator of Fannie and Freddie is the agency with a constitutional defect. But what they're fighting about in the lawsuit was ultimately subject to the Secretary of Treasury's, you know, approval. And the argument was in this at least unique circumstance, um, you know, first of all, they were saying you don't have to worry at all about, uh, the, you know, executive branch supervision. The president, you know, supervises the Secretary of Treasury and everything else. And then the standing component on the individual side was that maybe these folks who are they're Fannie and Freddie shareholders who are suing. Uh, they are contesting uh, a, a deal that the uh, conservator basically struck with the Treasury uh, arising out of how, how to pay back certain loans from the financial crisis uh, to the two entities. And the shareholders are saying basically that the, you know, that the conservator did a deal with the devil with the Treasury and allowed it to do sort of a capital stripping campaign that hurt the shareholders. And there's a big question about whether they had you know, sufficient standing or injury to bring this case at all in the Fifth Circuit. So there's the, you know, to Alan's point, it's like, depending on the facts, you could say, well, don't worry about the constitutional problem. The president was involved in some way. And yeah, these people, maybe they were shareholders and they were injured, but maybe it's not enough in this case to, to worry about it. Look at the statute. It's a quite complicated case, but I agree with you. I think it's, it's a messy, messy area. And I think they'll have to grapple with it this term as well in that case, if I'm not mistaken. We have a, a question from Bill Drabble. Bill, are you there? I'm here. Um, I just, my question is, um, is there any areas where we could expect or at least think that a Justice Barrett would differ from her Republican appointed colleagues? Um, there's a lot of discussion as though she's just going to join in lockstep, which of course never happens. And one justice always has his unique views on the laws. So um, is there any area where we expect Justice Barrett to depart from uh, the other Republican appointees? Ed, do you want to start? Sure. Look, I think it's very difficult to say. I mean, the, the, I'm sure there will be such areas, but um, she's been on the Seventh Circuit uh, for three years as a federal appellate judge. She and her colleagues are making sense, or try, uh, trying to make sense of the same Supreme Court opinions, the same circuit precedent as each other. So there really isn't um, an opportunity to see a whole lot about uh, uh, differences there. Uh, again, she has a, you know, unlike um, Justice Thomas, um, she has uh, uh, supported the more traditional approach to stare decisis on constitutional issues, but that doesn't distinguish her uh, from uh, the other seven justices. Um, 
Yeah, I think uh, we have a lot, a lot to to learn. Uh, she has um, made clear at the in the White House Rose Garden ceremony that Justice Scalia's judicial philosophy is is hers as well. She's also written that, of course, textualists and originalists uh, operating in good faith don't always um, arrive at the same answers on on on, on questions. So uh, I, I can't identify any particular areas right now, but I'm, uh, as the questioner uh, indicates, I'm sure there will be uh, some. I think it's interesting, like, like Justice Thomas, one of the things that struck me about some of her opinions in the Seventh Circuit, you know, I think she's had some questions about doctrines like qualified immunity for law enforcement, and then she's had some cases, uh, you know, whether it's actually, frankly, her Second Amendment opinion, where she looks to what the point of these restrictions were originally, or I think it was that uh, the bathrobe case. I like to think of it about, you know, who can give consent to an entry. You know, one of the things where you saw, and I always point out, you know, it's interesting, Justice Thomas has crossed, you know, sort of lines on the court is in the Fourth Amendment area, right? I think there was the thermal imaging case where his view was because, you know, originally uh, the government or law enforcement wouldn't be able to look into your house uh, the way the police did in a thermal imaging case, that that kind of uh, search was constitutionally impermissible. It ended up being a pro-criminal defendant uh, result. Uh, based on an application of originalist, you know, sort of jurisprudence. I, you know, it may be that in, in some cases, and again, it's impossible to tell, but reading some of her opinions, there may be instances in which her approach to the law would, you know, land her in a place similar to where Justice Thomas is, where he's lining up with maybe an unlikely uh, majority on some of those types of questions. Hmm. Uh, we have a question from Dan Short. Go ahead, Dan. Hello, you there, Dan? Okay, uh, Anna, is it Suniva? Sorry about that, muted. It's Cineva. You're correct. Uh, um, so I just wanted to find out um, if any of you could comment on the case uh, called Torres v. Madrid, because that case is bringing up a lot of important aspects of um, police police use of force. As the case is about the excessive use of force. It's a civil case uh, under the Fourth Amendment, and uh, it sounds like or looks like it could potentially have implications for the doctrine of qualified immunity as well. I was wondering if you are aware of any other cases that could have implications on the subject matter, and if you could say anything about this case. As a matter of fact, I do know someone who can talk about Taurus v. Madrid, and that's Oren Kerr. <laughs> Yeah, Taurus is a really interesting case. It's going to be argued, I think, October 14th. And it, it deals with whether it's a seizure for the government to, uh, in this case, uh, shoot someone who keeps driving on. They're in a car, and they're, they're never actually um, restrained, but they are injured by the, by the, the shots in this case. Uh, and the question is whether that counts as a seizure of the person. And what's really interesting about this case is that usually a seizure means taking control, and this is not. Um, on the other hand, there's a good practical reason to say that this is a seizure, and that if it's a seizure, it then can be included in a Fourth Amendment excessive force claim, which would be you know, certainly an appeal, you know, a, a, a result that you would want from a standpoint of shooting someone counting as excessive force um, seems like a natural, natural thing, whether they happen to um, uh, stop or not. There's also a really interesting original angle to the Torres case, which is a lot of the briefing uh, in, in the case is about actually the history of what an arrest is. It turns out at common law, there was, it was a tort and also a crime uh, for someone to escape a, 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 a arrestor's presence. Uh, and there was a case law at the time about what exactly an arrest is that triggers this tort of escape. And that was, that was way back in an era where there were no uh, uh, general police officers. Instead, you had like private parties and constables that were in charge of arresting people. They would often want to let them go because it was a big drag to have to bring the prisoner um, to, to court. And so it was actually uh, a, a, a tort or a crime of the constable to 
let someone go. And there were cases on what counts as an arrest and the idea being an arrest is a seizure that said, as long as the uh, uh, constable lays a finger on someone, even if they don't submit to the officer's authority, that is uh, an arrest. And the argument is, does that fit into modern Fourth Amendment law in the same way or not? Um, uh, and very plausibly, it might, you might see kind of a combination of originalist views and uh, practical concerns about the use of excessive force from the left, and you might get kind of a right-left coalition saying that that is a seizure under the Fourth Amendment. You know, there was a quite a right-left coalition uh, last term that thought that the court would take up this issue uh, and some cases involving qualified immunity, thoughts that it has gone uh, too far, That the and the court uh, did absolutely nothing with those cases and didn't seem to give uh, much of a reason, it's like maybe we were all wrong that they were actually considering them. Uh, what, what do you think is happening there? Does anyone have a, a theory? I, I'll offer one thought, which is a, a difficulty with overturning the qualified immunity cases is that what do you replace it with? Uh, that then starts this long um, uh, body of new law that would have to be created of exactly what the standard is and how would the standard apply. There's one thing just to say, there's no qualified immunity ever, period. But then what happens if it was, for example, an officer who conducted a search or seizure that was deemed constitutional at the time and then the law changed? How do you deal with that? Is there some sort of a good faith exception? Do you narrow qualified immunity? What? Where do you go to? There are a lot of really big choices and it may be that they're just trying to to find a way to take pieces of the puzzle one at a time, or they don't want to take on such a big issue with a single case. That that may be why some of the justices are reluctant to to jump into this because the implications are huge, and uh, and also I think you know given that Congress um, uh, in the in the context of 1983 at least could just amend section 1983, uh, maybe they are just maybe they're figuring that it could chew up to Congress. So those are just some guesses. Because Congress always jumps in to fix the problem. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and I've written they could do it very simply. Uh, they just uh, eliminate it and, and uh, impose liability on the cities and, and counties. Uh, and uh, that's essentially what the law is for the federal government under, under the Federal Tort Claims Act. And if it's good enough for the federal government, it ought to be good enough for cities and states. This is actually an idea that's been around since uh, the mid early 1980s. It almost had a chance of being passed back then. Uh, but I think Orrin is right that they just don't have the slightest idea how they could tinker with this doctrine to, to do two things, make it clear and, and, and eliminate a lot of the cases and a lot of the problems. So I, I, don't, I don't expect the court will do anything on qualified immunity. I think that the chance was there and it didn't take it. Okay. We have another question uh, from... Uh, Carly, do I have that correctly? Can you hear me? We can. Hi, thank you so much. Um, my question is in relation to the privileges and immunities, and if you think there's going to be any movement towards reliance on an, an originalist viewpoint, as in you know a lot of Justice De Thomas's dissents. If there's any, maybe uh, if there were Justice Barrett, if that he would be able to maybe pull her in on some of that, um, some of his arguments, which others have declined to follow. Elizabeth, do you want to start with that? Take that. Sure. Sorry, I had to unmute. Um, you know, I think it's a hard but very interesting question. I mean, I think, you know, this gets to a very you know, sensitive area of the Supreme Court's work. You know, it's an intersection of stare decisis and all of the precedents the court has built up on around the notion of substantive due process and whether the privileges or immunities clause would actually be a more legitimate basis for supporting some of those decisions. So I think, um, I don't, I, I, what I will say is I don't expect, again, sort of a, a seismic shift or a rapid, you know, progression there. I think, um, uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised, I'll put it this way, if, if perhaps there's more attention given to those sorts of arguments uh, going forward if, if Judge Barrett's confirmed. Um, I think we have time for one more, and I think Dan Short is back after having some technical problems. Yes, uh, can you hear me, hear me now? I can. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Um, and apologies for the issue earlier. Um, I was just curious, your perspective going back to the uh, discussion on the ACA case, 
of um, how you think about the likelihood of Gorsuch, Alito, um, or Thomas, uh, and potentially Kavanaugh as well, siding with uh, with um, the other justices on on severability, or or on another ground upholding substantively the the uh, legislation. Mm -hmm. Aaron, do you want to start start us off on that? Sure. So um, if you're, I think those justices will probably uh, look um, skeptically at the constitutional issue. Um, so Justice Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, Alito, uh, Thomas, uh, potentially the chief, uh, potentially uh, Justice Barrett, I think will be skeptical on the constitutional question. Um, I think the um, severability question is actually not really an ideological one. Um, of course, the court's doctrine is simply to ask what Congress would have intended. Um, and this is a complicated case because you have the 2010 statute and then you have the 2017 amendment uh, that zeroed out uh, the mandate. Um, I think you have Kavanaugh um, sort of uh, talking in favor last term about narrow severability. Um, you have the chief talking about narrow, sever uh, narrow uh, severability doctrine and sort of the presumption, uh, even if it's not expressed, that in constitutional questions, uh, you do uh, look uh, to see if the statute can be severable, um, and the presumption is that it is. Um, so, so yes, I do think those justices uh, could find the statute to be severable. Justice Kavanaugh had a decision last term in which he said constitutional litigation is not gotcha um, legislation for something that Congress may have inadvertently done. Anyone else have something on that? No. All right, well, that is our time. Uh, I wanna thank you all for participating. Uh, if I had some way to um, show applause, I would do it. Uh, but, you know, perhaps uh, Lee knows better, so I'm gonna turn this back over to her. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Thanks all so much. Thank you very much, Bob. Thanks to all of our speakers. I think there is a way to do it, but I don't know how to do it. There's an <laughs> icon, uh, but uh, but but I I I'm not that I'm not so Zoom proficient that I know how to do it. But uh, I do want to thank all of you uh, for a very stimulating uh, discussion of the upcoming term and uh, for very for for very interesting uh, discussion also about uh, the potential impact of, of, of Justice Barrett. Um, thanks so much to all of you for watching, uh, and we hope to see you soon at another Federal Society event. Uh, check out our webpage at federalsociety.org for uh, our upcoming uh, events. And with that, uh, thanks, for, thanks everybody, and, uh, and uh, have a good afternoon.